All right, guys, we're going to get started. Um, can I get Tori, Steve-O, and uh, Jake yeah. to pray? presence with other people. Um, I'm just excited to be here right now, Jesus. Uh, just ready to hear whatever it is you have to say to us, Jesus. Um, just ready to leave my heart in your hands uh, so that you can mold and shape it uh, however you want it to look, Jesus. Uh, I want to pray for our time here uh, that it's just all about you that our hearts would be aligned uh, with just being focused on you, that this time is set aside for us to just be with you, to look at you, uh, to leave here looking like you. I pray, Jesus, that your spirit uh, would fill us and would fill this place, and that we would leave here uh, just knowing that we encountered the King that we would leave here uh, ready to go down to the bottom of the mountain. That we would just leave here ready to uh, be done with self. I'm just thankful for this time right now, Jesus. I'm going to pray this in your name. Yeah, Jesus. Um... I don't want this to be just uh, just another day or just another Wednesday that uh, we gather together in this room. Um, I want this to be a, a day to where we really uh, absorb these words. I want this to be a day that we um, not just sing some songs, but really worship and bring glory uh, to you right now. Uh, I pray that we can all get ourselves out of the way. Get ourselves out of the way so that uh, your words through Ken can seek uh, deep into our hearts. So that we can use these words uh, to guide our footsteps in our everyday lives. So Jesus, I, I too pray, man, that we can just uh, get up from this room and leave changed. And Jesus, that's amazing, man, that we just get to gather here as a family and, and fellowship and share a meal together and, and have communion together. So Jesus, uh, we love you. It's in your name. Amen. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that you allowed us to come together and uh, worship you, Lord. I not only want uh, your words to penetrate our hearts, Lord, I want uh, 
all our hearts to be near you, Lord. Uh, thank you for the food that you allow us to have in our bodies. Uh, thank you for this time that you're allowing us to spend together in church. Uh, I want to thank you for every uh, every prayer that's not answered and answered, Lord. Uh, Lord, I love you. This is the only way I pray. Amen. Amen. separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love, no power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us 
from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Kelly. Hey, well, we had well. million. We gonna uh, read a few uh, verses out of Matthew. Matthew 7, verse 12, it says, Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Matthew 26, verse 17, it says, On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal for you? As you go into the city, he told them, you will see a certain man. Tell him, the teacher says, my time has come, and I will eat the Passover meal with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus told them and prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, am I the one, Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the Scripture declared long ago. But how terrible it would be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who will betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, You have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. <clears throat> and, uh, 10 verse 12, it says, Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Take me. spend time <clears throat> meditating on Jesus and, <clears throat> and who he is and we're about to sing a song about what a beautiful name Jesus is. Um, I was led to a scripture in Hebrews chapter 2 because I was thinking about some of the words in, in the song uh, where it talks about um, you didn't want heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven down. Our sin was great, your love was greater, what could separate us now? You know, and on the heels of what Travis had read as well. So in Hebrews 2, it says, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Yeah. 
Good evening, church. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right, if I can get you guys to go to James chapter 2, uh, 14. good deeds is dead. <coughs> what is it what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing. And you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? <coughs> so you see faith by itself isn't enough. <clears throat> unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now some may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But any, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. <clears throat> you say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe, and they tremble in the terror. How foolish can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that, that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? <clears throat> you see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith uh, com complete. And so it happened... Just as the scripture says, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called a friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by <clears throat> what we do, not by faith alone. Rehab, the prostitute, is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid the messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so is also faith is dead without good works. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to pray. What's the prayer? Before we get started, and we're talking about faith, and I'm thinking about the communion that he did, and man, the scriptures were so good, and I'm just thinking about how they're sitting around the table, and Jesus says, look, one of you guys are going to betray me, you know, and this is obviously pre-Holy Spirit, pre-Pentecost, right, but all the disciples start going, is it me? <laughs> Am I going to do it? Is it me, Jesus? You know, and, and it's just crazy when you really think about that, that they just... They weren't sure, like Jesus was saying something, and they just didn't have this confidence that it wasn't them. And tonight we're talking about faith, and even, you know, the other scripture that he went to, um, you know, if you acknowledge me, Jesus is like, man, if you acknowledge me here, then I'll acknowledge you when I come in my glory and I set up my kingdom, and he's sitting on the throne, and, and on his glorious throne with all these angels, he goes, man, I'm going to acknowledge you then, but if you deny me here, I'll deny you then, and we all take our communion, you know, we're going, man, I'm acknowledging you, Jesus. And I think sometimes we can just think, because we're going to look at that tonight when it comes to faith, we, we, we don't have a clear understanding of what it really means to acknowledge Jesus. And I think sitting here right now, if it was like, hey, do you believe in Jesus? A bunch of us would say yes. Just keep in mind that what's happening here in James is Jesus is talking to people who would have said they had faith? And continuing along with, with what's going on here in James, it's a test. And he's testing to go, hey, do you have a faith that's alive or that's dead? But you know, before we even get into all of that, because I don't want anybody leaving here tonight and going, is it me, Jesus? Or do I really believe in you? Or do I have faith? Because even if you find yourself during this time, as we look at the Word of God, going, man... I don't line up. That doesn't mean you have to leave here still. 
in a place of like, I don't know if my faith is real. And so it gets reconciled here and now. And so I don't want anybody to have that kind of doubt. I want everybody to be filled with the Spirit and nobody having that same kind of doubt that the disciples had before they were filled with the Spirit when Jesus was like, somebody's going to deny me. And it was like, is it me? It could be me. You know, just asking. I want us to just have full confidence that when we say we believe in Jesus, we completely understand what that means. And man, we get to say that with confidence. And so even as we pray right now and we get into it, I'm thinking about faith. And, you know, Hebrews 11, 3 says, By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. And so we can just start there, right? You can go back before Genesis 1-1. Because what it's saying is like, listen, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. So take a minute and really think about that. And think about what you can see right now as you're seeing me stand here and arms moving and I'm talking, right? And we can look around and we see there's a ceiling here and there's windows and walls and bricks and all that. But, but what he's saying, Jesus is like, man, you trace that back. None of that stuff, right? We go, oh man, these walls came from trees. But it's like, if you trace it back, it all came from nothing that you can see but just the command of Jesus. Just really think about that for a moment. There is not a material or a person or anything that you can see here in this universe that came from something else that you can see. It originated from a command from Jesus' mouth. And it was formed. And it's by faith that we know that. That we know that. And we need to start there. We need to start right there. And we need to pray. That's who we're talking to. That's who's speaking. That's who we're talking to right now. And that's who's speaking. That by his command, the universe appeared. Nothing you see right here came from something else you can see. All originated from his mouth by his command. That's who he is. So let's talk to him. Jesus says, your glorious presence fills the temple, your people, the dwelling place where you live by your spirit. Would you push out and chase out anything that's not of you? Every time we see Jesus, your glorious presence filled the temple, flesh can't go in there. Flesh can't dwell there. <coughs> Would it be that way with us here and now? That as we sit at your feet and we hear you speak, that your spirit, that your glorious presence would fill your people here and everything of us would be chased out. Everything of us would be removed. And as we sit here united by your spirit, your glorious presence would dwell and fill us. Not just this place. We're the temple. Fill us with your glorious presence. Chase out anything that has to do with us. Our thoughts, our ways, our plans, everything, Jesus, here and now as we recognize that you've called us here to meet with you and by your command. That's how anything exists. And so we're listening, Jesus. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. <clears throat>
<laughs> so you know, um, like we live in a world where a lot of times, um, you know, close is good enough. I mean, it counts for something. Um, you know, we celebrate progress. We we celebrate even participation now, right? Like just showing up. It's like, hey, that counts. And you know, I was thinking there's a there's a saying, and maybe you've heard it, uh, close counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. And just to put it in like your guys' context, it'd be like close counts in cornhole and hand grenades. And 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 the idea behind that is right, and it says only and it's about success or whatever, but the idea behind it is like, hey, there's some things that if you're close enough, right, that, that you get some points for it, you get some credit for it. Um, you know, we celebrate second place and third place and runner runner up and all kinds of stuff. And so we just we live in a world where, hey, you know, everything has some kind of credit. You get some kind of credit for it, an effort, a for effort. We say things like that. Uh, but the idea about you know close counts in in cornhole and hand grenades is, you know, if, if you get close, there's some points for that. And even when talking about hand grenades, right? It's like, hey, you don't have to hit your target directly. If you could just get it close, some damage will be done and um, it, it'll still destroy the, the target. But I always, when I think about that saying, like I always think about the person throwing the grenade because there's not a whole lot of wiggle room on that end, <laughs> right? It's not like, it's not, you got like two seconds and that's because it goes off in four and the kill radius is 15 feet. So it's not like you can be a second off and you're okay. You know, there's just not a whole lot of room. Like, there's some things that have to be exact. And faith is one of them. And that's what Jesus is saying tonight. When he's talking here in James chapter 2. He's going, you know, close enough with faith isn't good enough. Like, it has to be exact. And, and so, you know, a lot of times when it comes to faith, um... You know, we think there's a, a lot of wiggle room. We think there's a lot of room for, for error. And people like to define things their own way. And people like to interpret things their own way. And it's no different with faith, you know. Um, people do that all the time. And, you know, we live in a world where uh, people say tomato, tomato. It, it means the same thing. We, we just say it differently. We're, we just pronounce it differently. You know, potato, potato. It, it, but it's the same fruit. It's the same vegetable. But then I would just say, well, we say football and football, depending on what country. And it's a completely different sport. Right? And, and that's kind of like what it is with faith. And that's kind of what's creeped into the church even. And over the years... We, we've come to understand faith in our own kind of way and interpret it our own way. But what Jesus is saying here, he's going, man, you know, there's no wiggle room here when it comes to faith. That there's like one definition, there's one interpretation of it, and it's pretty important because it's the difference between life and death. And not just life and death here physically, but life and death for eternity. And uh, so let me just read a couple passages really passage is really quick to, to get us started here and you know in James or in Mark chapter 1 this is what it says um, it says one day Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water for they fished for a living and Jesus called out to them come and follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people and immediately they said yes Jesus and they said a prayer and they accepted Jesus into their heart. And they were really good fishermen after that. And they talked about Jesus as they fished after that. And But that's not what it says. <laughs> that's just not what it says. Let me try another one here. You know, in, in Mark chapter 2. Then Jesus went out to the lakeshore again and taught the crowds. They, they, were, they were coming to him. And he walked along and he saw Levi sitting in his tax collector's booth. And he said, follow me and be my disciple. And Levi said... Yes. And he said a prayer and he accepted Jesus into his heart. And he believed in Jesus. And he wasn't, he wasn't a crooked tax collector anymore. He was a better tax collector. When people came to pay their taxes, he talked about Jesus. And that's not what it says. Because that's not what faith is. But I think everybody in this room has heard that before. Hey, just pray. 
and accept Jesus into your heart, and you'll be saved. And all of us probably know somebody that, that like, literally, they, they died. And you wouldn't have known, really, if they loved Jesus or not, but in talking to people, they would say, well, they believed in Jesus. But you couldn't see it in their life. You couldn't really tell. Other than them saying that, other than them claiming to believe in Jesus, that's the only thing. And I think a lot of times, that's how it's been interpreted here. Is that, hey, you just have to say a prayer and accept Jesus in your heart. You believe in him, and you're good. And now you're saved. And we have all kinds of people, and people even sitting in this room right here, that would say, hey, I believe in Jesus. But it doesn't mean that it's a faith that's alive. And Jesus says here, there's a faith that you can have and believe in him, and it's dead. It's not alive. And, and that's what's happening here in James. Jesus is going, close isn't good enough when it comes to faith. It's not like, you don't get any credit for that. It has to be exact. It has to be what faith actually is. <laughs> and, and what's it say here? In, in 14, it says, you say you have faith, but if you don't show it by your actions, can that sign, kind of faith save anyone? Let me just answer that question. No, it's a rhetorical question. I mean, think about that right now. Jesus is saying that there's a faith that you can claim to have that doesn't save you. See, that's not, that's not popular being taught. But it's true. It's here in his words. There's a faith that you can have that doesn't save you. And that's what he's saying. Can that kind of faith save anyone? No. No, it can't. A faith that does not change you does not save you. A faith that does not change you does not save you. Right? What really happened in those passages that I read? I mean, Jesus came along and said to Andrew and Simon, follow me and, and you'll fish for people. And immediately they left the boat. Immediately there was this change as they followed Jesus. What they valued changed. What they thought was important changed. He goes a little bit further down the way and sees James and John, and he says the same thing to them. And listen, they left their dad and the workers in the boat and left. Now, listen, you think Vin Diesel and the Fast and the Furious is all about family? Like, the Jewish people... We're all about blood relatives and all about carrying on the family business. For them to get out of the boat and leave dad in the business was like unheard of. That wasn't something that you did. That wasn't something that's normal. Maybe normal in our culture. I don't want to follow in your footsteps. Not then. That was such a big deal. And so they get out immediately. And what's, what's Levi do? He gets up and he leaves his tax collector's booth. There's immediate change. A faith that doesn't change you doesn't save you. It doesn't save you. Because a real faith, a real faith, means that the Spirit of Jesus enters you. And the Spirit of Jesus is not going to enter you and leave you the same. And so a faith that doesn't change you doesn't save you. And what else do we see? It says, well, how can you say you have faith? Remember, guys, these are people, these are Christians, people claiming to be Christians. This book isn't written to unbelievers. So these are people claiming to be Christians, and he's going... How can you say you have faith? There's people claiming to have faith. People claiming to believe. And he goes, how can you, if you don't show it by your acts? So what's the next thing we see? You can see faith. You can see faith. It's not some mystical thing floating around. It's not something you just claim. 
You can see it. Jesus, all through the Bible, it said, seeing their faith. He healed them. Seeing their faith, he did this. Jesus at one point goes, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. My favorite, one of my favorites is in Mark chapter 2. Because there's these four guys that are carrying this guy on a mat. And you can see their faith. Because their faith caused them to what? Climb up a house, drag a guy on a mat up on top of a house, dig a hole in the roof, and lower him down there. And Jesus was seeing their faith. Jesus saw their faith. And what I love about that one, and one of the, the reason it's one of my favorites, is because he said seeing their faith, right? Even the guys carrying them. It wasn't just the guy on the mat that had to get to Jesus, but there was other people that had this faith that affected other people, that affected this crippled guy on the mat. And Jesus said, man, seeing their faith, even the guys that were carrying, even the guys that were willing to, to not just take the easy route, climb up on this house and dig a hole in the roof and do anything possible to get him to Jesus' feet. Jesus, seeing their faith, forgives this guy and heals him. And that's what Jesus says. He's giving an example here. He's going, man, people that are, don't have food and don't have clothing, you know, you can't just say to them, I'll, I'll pray for you. He goes, man, there'll be action, right? So, so the next thing we, we see is there, there should be this move of compassion. If, if the faith you have doesn't move you, <coughs> you're not moved by compassion, not just feeling sorry, but moved by compassion. Willing to do anything, right? Not just give them a surplus. Sure, do that, right? Give some people, you got some extra food, don't be hoarding it. You got some extra clothes, don't be hoarding it. But that's not even it, right? Now, you'd be willing to go without what it looks like. How Jesus gives up everything. Like, you'd be willing to go without clothes so somebody else could have clothes. Man, you'd be willing to go without food so that somebody else could eat. See, a faith that actually affects other people, that they experience your faith. That's a real faith. A real faith, man, if the Spirit of Jesus is in you, right, he's, he's moved by compassion. So you're going to be moved by compassion. You're going to want to alleviate people's suffering. And you're going to be willing to go without so they can have. And so a real faith is moved by compassion. <clears throat> And people can experience your faith. This faith can be seen. Jesus saw it all the time. And so he gives this, this uh, you know, he gives this example here of like somebody that doesn't have clothing or doesn't have food. And, and he says, listen, if you're not moved by compassion, that kind of faith is useless and dead. And it's the same word because people love to play on words. And you guys know me. I'm not the, you know, Greek theologian because it's just like it's, it's not that important when it comes down to it. But people love to play on words and talk about Ephesians 2. You, know, you were dead in your sins. It means you couldn't do anything. It's the same word used here for faith. For a faith that you can't see. For a faith that's not moved by compassion. For a faith that doesn't change you. And so there's people that can claim to believe in Jesus, and they're still dead in their sin. And listen, I didn't know exactly how to pray coming in here tonight <laughs> with you guys. I love you so much, and I'm just going, man, I, I don't want anybody to leave here. But I, the, the worst thing I could do, the worst thing any Christian could do, or anybody in my kind of role or position could ever do, is, is not let you know how serious it is when it comes to faith. But see, people do that all the time. People do that all the time. They give you some false hope and some false promise of peace with Jesus based on some faith that's dead. I don't want anybody leaving here being fooled or deceived thinking you really believe in Jesus because, I mean, look, look at what's happening here. It's like, a, it's like a crazy joke. Like, as I was sitting here, like, reading this as many times with Jesus, like, stop me if you've heard this one, right? A, a demon, Abraham, and a prostitute walk into eternity. 
Well, those are the examples he's about to give for faith. He starts with demons. Do you realize what he's saying here? He's going, man, there's demons that have more faith than you. They actually tremble at the presence of Jesus. Where where do you see a demon not fall down and squeal and do whatever Jesus tells them to do? And so, like, probably one of the most, you know, alarming verses in the Bible is James 2.19. Where he goes, oh, yeah, you believe in God. Good for you. So do the demons. It's like, whoa, hold on a minute. He goes, so do the demons. He goes, but guess what? They really believe because they tremble. They tremble. They, think about a demon. A demon is completely rebellious. And yet when they get in the presence of Jesus, they tremble in his presence and do whatever he tells them to do. The pigs, pigs of us. Right? And, and what Jesus is saying is, like, there's people running around saying they have faith in me, saying they believe in me, but they're rebellious and they're doing whatever they want to do. And he goes, so you believe. Well, good for you. So do the demons. But they tremble. And in, in Isaiah 64, Jesus is, you know, he's like, man, Isaiah's going, man, that you would burst through the clouds and come down. He goes, guess what? Creation would quake. Mountains would quake. Water would boil. The nations would tremble because of your presence. And yet, listen, we're supposed to be people that have that presence living inside of us? <laughs> have you lost that? Would you tremble at his presence? Because the demons do. <coughs> Lots of people say they believe, but they don't struggle. With it. And then it goes on in Isaiah uh, 66. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. I spoke and created everything, and I've blessed those with humble and contrite hearts that tremble at my word. Do you tremble at his word? Real faith trembles at the word of God. Real faith? Doesn't want to be out of step with Jesus and his commands one bit. Always wants to be in the will of God. No matter what that looks like. And so the first example he gives is the demons. And he goes, but they tremble. They tremble at his presence. They tremble at his word. Do you? Do you tremble at Jesus' presence? Do you tremble at his word? As you read this and you go, man, this, this is Jesus speaking, and he spoke, and by his command, the universe, nothing we see came from anything we can't see. He spoke, and that's what started anything and everything. You trace it all, and guess what? You trace it all back to him and him speaking. And so, how much should we tremble as we read this? Because that's what he's saying in Isaiah 66. You have this humble, contrite heart, and you just tremble at his word. Because what Jesus is saying, hey, a lot of people that claim to have faith in me are no different than the demons. In fact, some of the demons believe more than people that claim to have faith. And so before we get caught up on, hey, it's food and clothing, and because and, this is what people do, right? We always want to take the path of least resistance. And so it's like real faith, okay, i got to feed the poor, and i got to give clothing to the poor. Yeah, you should do that. That's a command, right? We saw that. Real religion, right? True religion, pure religion is taking care of the orphans and the widows, but not being corrupted by the world. And so we should be caring for people less fortunate. We should be moved with compassion. That's what real faith is. But the demons believe and know that he's God. And even though they're in rebellion, when, he, when they're in his presence, man, they tremble and they do whatever Jesus tells them to do. And then listen, he, he goes to Abraham. That's the next example. It's Abraham. You think you have faith? 
You, you claim to have faith. You, you believe in Jesus. We'll look at Abraham. And he starts talking about Genesis chapter 22, where his faith was tested. Abraham's faith was tested. He goes, man, you know that one son that you have? Your one and only son? The one that you love so much? He goes, go and offer him as a sacrifice to me. And in Genesis 22, one of the craziest things about that is, it says, so Abraham got up early the next day to go do it. Of all the things you would get up early and be eager to do, that would be one of the last, right? But yet, this is what faith looks like. That he trusted in Jesus like this. And, and people water it down. I've talked to so many people, and they're like, yeah, but Abraham knew that you know Jesus wasn't going to make him go through with it. And so he just knew the whole time that you know he wasn't going to make him do it. But that's not what the Word says. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, in Hebrews 11, when it's talking about it, listen to what it says here in verse 17. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. So I love this because it's like, guess what? He didn't understand it all. And he didn't have it all figured out. But guess what? He knew who Jesus was. And before you think, it's like, oh, he knew he wasn't going to make him go through it. Listen to what it says here. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died... God was able to bring him back to life again. So he didn't go there thinking, oh, he's not going to make me do it. He had faith that he was like, even if I do it, because that's what he told me to do, I'm going to do whatever he tells me to do, right? Abraham was an obedient person because he had real faith. And he goes, even when I go ahead and I kill him and I sacrifice him, he goes, oh, he'll just raise him back from the dead. He goes, he'll just bring him back from the dead. That's what he was counting on. He was like, Jesus can do anything. That's the kind of faith that Abraham had. And at the end of it, right, when he's about to do it, and he stops him, right, Jesus stops him. And what's he say? He goes, now I know that you truly fear the Lord. He goes, because you didn't even withhold your only son from me. See, he didn't ask Abraham to do what was easiest. Think about who Abraham is. You know what would have been easier for him? What would any parent like that do? With the son they love so much. Take me. Take me instead, right? She'd be like, spare my son. Spare my only son. Take me. I'll take his place. But see, that would have been easy for Abraham. The hard thing was not to withhold what he cared about most on this earth. And so that's what Jesus pulled on. To say, do you really believe? Think about what you withhold. Like, honestly. Think about what you withhold here. I mean, we want to withhold money and possessions and, you know, all kinds of things. We want, to, we want to withhold our plans. And what Jesus is saying here is that a real faith, a genuine faith, a faith that's alive, withholds nothing. Withholds nothing from him. It's all his. And so think about it. As you sit here right now, and you go, if you're somebody who goes, man, I believe in Jesus. What is it the Holy Spirit's speaking to you right now going, but you wouldn't let that go? What is it that you're holding on to? Even just yourself. And I love it because the next example that Jesus gives is a prostitute. So you go from Abraham, who seems like a pretty selfless guy, who's a very obedient guy. We've got, man, what a family man. What, what, a, what a businessman. You know, he had all kinds of cattle and stuff. And then you go to the, the prostitute. And what I love about this is we see the level playing field with faith. He puts Abraham and this prostitute together with faith. It goes, yeah, but by her faith, she was saved. Now, what's the easiest thing for somebody like a prostitute would be to, to give somebody else, to sacrifice somebody else? That's what they do, right? They use people. They're all about themselves and being self-centered, and they use other people. And so she's put in a position where she has to risk her own life. So she, has to, she has to give up her own life, her own safety, and her own security. 
And she hides the spies. She hides the messengers. But even when it's talking about Rahab in, in Hebrews 11, in verse 31, it was by faith that Rahab, the prostitute, was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God. You get this? You want to talk about peer pressure? Her whole city refused to obey God. See, she was willing to go against the grain. She was willing to go against the current. She didn't get to go the path of least resistance. It wasn't what was easiest for her. She had to risk her life to hide those people. And this was all about his kingdom. Right? He was advancing his kingdom. And she was for the advancement of peace and willing to put her life on the line for it to happen. And not giving in to everybody around her and everybody in the whole city refused to obey God. And here she stood and went, no, I, I want to be different. I want, I want Jesus. I'm going to go against what everybody else does. And I'm going to give up my life. And risk my life, lay my life down. I'd rather lose my life than disobey Jesus anymore. And so she puts her life on the line. And that's what real faith looks like. You didn't love your life so much that you were afraid to die. That's real faith. If it's not that, it's a dead faith. I don't care how much you believe in Jesus. It's like, so do the demons. So do a bunch of people, but you can't see it. And it says what? That Abraham was considered a friend. A friend of God. But he didn't withhold anything from him. Everybody wants to have friendship with Jesus, and it's possible through faith. <coughs> but this is what faith looks like. This is what real faith looks like. You don't withhold anything, even your own life. It's all Jesus's. It all belongs to him. And so, it, it, it ends here in this section by talking about That like a body that doesn't have breath. Just as a body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. So listen, if anybody stopped breathing, lay down on the floor here and just stopped breathing, we'd be okay, they're dead. And what he's pointing to is going, man, it's no different with faith. A faith that you can't see, a faith that's not displayed through the manifestation of the presence of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's really talking about. It's not like you're just supposed to go do some good things. All these things are things that Jesus did. Right? That the Father sacrificed his one and only Son. Okay? We don't talk about Isaac enough, but you don't see him kicking and screaming. And you don't see him fighting. He willingly goes as a sacrifice. It's a picture of Jesus. It's a picture of the cross. When he's talking about being moved with compassion, Jesus was moved with compassion and fed people. When the disciples were talking about what? <clears throat> well, we can't feed them. Send them away. And Jesus is like, no, we're going to feed them. It's not somebody else's responsibility. Jesus was moved with compassion. And so, how, how, how does it line up for you? Don't leave here tonight if you claim to be a follower of Jesus without being reconciled to what real faith is. Don't leave here with a dead faith. Don't be deceived and go off thinking you're good because you believe in Jesus if the spirit of Jesus is not manifesting <laughs> in and through your life, if the Holy Spirit is not flowing from your heart, if there's not rivers of living water bursting, there's not life bursting from your heart, then 
I know a lot of people that claim to believe in Jesus. They're not patient. They're not joyful. They're not loving. They're angry and they're scared and they're depressed and they're worried and they're all these other things. I think, oh, but I believe in Jesus. He goes, that's not what real faith looks like. You can call it faith and believe and trust and all that. I remember a long time ago, like I was at the Knights of Columbus when we started and, and we were talking about, we were in the book of John and we were talking about believe because John was big on, when he talked about faith, he said believe. And I brought in a baseball tee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. A, a baseball tee and a baseball and an aluminum bat. And I was like, you know, I played baseball. Who believes I could hit this ball off the tee, right? And a bunch of people, yeah, I believe you could do that. Sure. And I was like, who would be willing to put their hand there on top of the tee and hold it? And like less than half people were like, uh, I guess I think you could probably pull that one off. It's like, who wants to put their head down and put it in their ear? Let me just swing away. Right? And was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it. We, we, we say we believe. Start off, oh, yeah, we believe you can hit that ball, man, that you wouldn't hit the tee. Yeah. But then what? When we had to put our, our money where our mouth is, so to speak, it's like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't believe you're going to do that. You know, um, one of the things is like, who, who here, when they were a kid, their parents, you know, told them Santa Claus was real and you believe in Santa Claus. Lots of people, right? I did not tell you that. Yeah. No. <laughs> My kid was the one running around ruining the whole thing at grade school. Yeah. And called the parents and... Teachers going, tell your kid to quit ruining Christmas. <laughs> I didn't send him in there like that, right? But he was just like, that's not true. But, but people you believe this, right? Like, you know, you know, like parents had their kids believe this, or you knew, or you know of kids that do, and, and what happened? What they do? They, they, they put cookies out, and they put milk out, and then reindeer food got involved somehow, and you know? <laughs> And, and, but listen, the, the point I'm getting at is some people believe in Santa, have more faith in Santa than Christians that claim to believe in Jesus. People running around putting cookies out for Santa. They're like, man, I really believe. It moved them to some kind of action. Right? When you believe the weather report, you dress accordingly. We cancel outdoor events. Right? When you really believe something, there's an action that follows. When you really believe something, there's an action that follows. That's why somebody's sitting here going, tremble and like, are you kidding me? If you really believe, he's going to decide whether you take one more breath? Man, that makes you quiver inside. Oh my gosh. Not, not in just necessarily a dreadful way. It's like, oh my gosh, like, you're holding my life. Every breath, every moment in your hand. Like, that's who you are. And I get to know you. And I spend time with you. I hope you spend time with him. You know, we're singing that God is so good song, and I love just the last line. Because it's talking about God, and then it's like starts singing to him. And every time we sing that song, it makes me think of Psalm 23. Because Psalm 23 starts by talking about God. The Lord's my shepherd, everything I need, right? He's talking about him. And he, he does this, and he lays me down, and peace with streams, and he leads me around. Right? But then he gets in the dark valley, and he's like, you are close beside me. Something changes there. There's this intimacy all of a sudden in the middle of that psalm. Where it's like, man, because he's in this dark valley, he's like you. He starts talking directly to him. And there's this close intimacy. I hope that's what it looks like for you to spend time with Jesus. As I was up here and we were listening to music before, I was holding Delilah. Because I can still do it. I'm not too old, right? She's not too big yet. And I'm holding her. We're singing together. And I'm thinking in my head, like, oh, man, I hope. Because I've been spending time with Jesus like that. And I'm going, man, I hope that our people are spending time with Jesus like this. <coughs> I hope they're letting Jesus hold them. I hope they're letting Jesus carry them. I hope you're really spending time with him. And I hope when you go into his presence, you tremble. And you'll know when you're in his presence, because you will. I've heard his voice. Put me on my face. I didn't get down. I, I had no choice. Don't leave here with a dead faith. Be reconciled. 
Fear him now. Don't leave here with a dead faith. Leave here with a faith that's alive. Let's pray. <clears throat>